When we first started to, to know each other, if there's a great joke, no. you don't leave it on the table. Does comedy come from pain? And I am not a comedy philosopher, but what I do know is that using comedy to transmute pain, the notion that we either laugh or we cry, I totally believe in. And so areas where you're like, that's an inappropriate joke, I'm not saying it is because I would otherwise cry, but I do believe it's right. in a transmute, mution, is that, is that the word? No. no. What is that it word? It transmutes, I don't think you To can... transmute. Yeah. Uh, intense emotion and okay, bring so, levity to it. I okay. think we need levity. If we're not this having fun, okay. why bother? Okay. <laughs> Here's the thing. I agree you with you. You don't like fun. No. <laughs> I agree with you. But? But is it also possible <laughs> when the rhythm of a conversation or an emotional movement is happening that you simply cannot resist saying the thing in your head, much like a 14-year-old child. And you can't gauge, and it, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of spectrum in here sometimes, I think, for you, because I often think like, do you, can you not read the <laughs> Like, if I'm already crying about something, <laughs> that's a great time not to poke fun at me. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's gonna break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. And now she's gonna break down. It's a breakdown. She's gonna break it down. Hi, I'm Maya Bialik. I'm Jonathan Cohen. Welcome to our Thursday breakdown. Tuesday got so full. Tuesday got so full. Now, Jonathan, the reason that we have come here today is that we released an episode with Mark Marin a few weeks ago. I remember. It was a powerful episode. He ate a macaroon on camera. <laughs> you sh you stuffed him with food from the second he walked in the door, even though he told us that he has eating stuff. I thought that meant he was hungry. Jonathan, we we looked at Mark. So Mark Marin, for those of you who are not aware, Mark Marin is sort of our godfather of podcasting. He began his podcast in 2009, and he has uh, 55 million listeners on average every year. Um, his podcast is WTF with Mark Marin. We read his book. Attempting Normal. Attempting Normal. And I've seen Mark do comedy at comedy stores, mainly where I've seen him. I never thought that he would come and talk to us, but he did. And he opened up a lot more than I expected. Sometimes with comedians, like they're so, you know, they like tell it all on stage, but then when they get off stage, no, he's a person who likes to talk all the time about all the things. When he talked about sort of why and how he started podcasting, I asked him about kind of the vulnerability that he exhibits and the way that he chooses to be so open about all of his stuff, in particular about his family. The stuff that he spoke about, about his parents, like he pulls no punches. And this T shocked me. Tell us what he said about his parents. The first thing I want to say is that the fact that he said all of the things that he said about his parents already blew my mind. Like the fact that he was just like, this is what they did. And it fucked me up. Like that shocked me. He calls them narcissists. He said that his, his father was a, a, a a very, very rough narcissist. His mom, he talks in the book also, his mom, he said, was an expert at anorexia. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like, you know, they they functioned in a very dysfunctional way. But one of the things that he talked about was, you know, he turned to, to music. He turned to drugs. He turned to all of these things to sort of feel um, a sense of belonging. And um, I was struck because you've shared a lot and I've shared a lot about our teen years, which teen years are difficult. Like teen years are rough. They're hard. It, it, there's there's hard things about everybody's, you know, life that makes teen years hard. But there was something in particular about this notion of kind of feeling like you don't have structure or boundaries. And I wonder, Jonathan, like, did, did anything come up for you in terms of, um, you know, hearing someone talk about that who also like, you know, has kind of bumped along in life by his own admission. Like, can't really have a relationship. Like, doesn't really feel like he's successful at relationships. He really puts it on that kind of lack of structure early on. It's interesting that you say he put it on the lack of structure. He actually didn't connect it 
to that particularly. Mm -hmm. He talks about his childhood, but you went and sort of did a uh, attachment theory <laughs> orientation to like, oh, you know, the basic core need of a child is to be attached and have the scaffolding I think you may have used or um, structure of the mm -hmm. parents being there for you. And when you don't have that, then you're constantly um, concerned in relationships as things get closer that mm. it's going to bump up against that wound. And so you then lash out because it's basically, you know, explain a little bit more about attachment theory disorder. Well, there's different styles of attachment and they... Um, you know, they form from a, a combination of genetic predisposition, you know, uh, babies do have temperament and also, uh, you know, early experiences, you know, often I hate, I hate to say it, but often that first year is a big one. When you have parents who yes. use you as an object of their needs and don't meet your needs and you feel uncomfortable around them, but you're still a child and you want to have a relationship and you have basic needs that are not getting met, then as you become an adult and you're in adult grown up relationships, <laughs> as you get that closeness, as you get love in romantic situations, those wounds are going to spike. Right. And then they don't, you don't know that they're spiking. And so what right. you think is this person is horrible right. or I feel or so needy. uncomfortable right. or I'm crawling out of my skin. And so he talks about how he like makes things unbearable for anyone who loves them. And as it becomes more and more unbearable, he's pushing them, pushing them, pushing them away. It's like almost replaying that parental role to say, are you going to love me enough to overcome whatever wound I have? And then as soon as they pull away, he's like, no, I need this person so badly. And so he's caught in a cycle, but he didn't attach that to his upbringing. He said, oh, I'm fucked up or I'm messed up, but he right. didn't say, oh, it's because of this attachment disorder. So it's like either uh, you, you sort of phrased it for him in a different way than well, he Well, I think, well, what, what also struck me about Mark is he has, you know, and, and in his book, I mean, in this book in particular, Attempting Normal, he talks about his attempts to like have a relationship, like be a normal person. But he said that like, he didn't even realize how big of an asshole he was. Like he was just operating on this automatic pilot and fueled by a lot of drugs. And and there's different kinds of drugs. The drugs that he chose to use were drugs that can make for some volatility. Well, he's always had a level of anger. We talked about where did that anger start and does he remember being angry? Mm -hmm. And that anger is very difficult to metabolize at, in a relationship. Like where does that anger go when you're supposed to be soft and right. vulnerable and caring and connected. Well, I think that's what he was saying also is that, I mean, this is this was kind of his, he said, having needy, selfish, detached parents deny you a fundamental sense of self. Like, that's a tremendous statement, especially, I mean, you know, he's almost 60, right? I mean, to his own, by his own admission. Yeah, he's a 59-year-old man <laughs> at time of recording. Right. Um, and... One of the first things that he said when we were talking about sort of like how he got to be the way he was, he spit it right out. He said, I saw porn too young. He did say that. And like, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that. I mean, obviously, I've heard people talk about seeing porn too young, but like it was literally like, hey, what was going on for you? What was your, you know, um, that that sounded very significant. And, you know, this is a, a, another thing uh, uh, along with many aspects of childhood. And, and, you know, as a parent, you wonder, like, what am I doing that's going to fuck up my children irreparably? Like, if I shouted because they didn't take the litter out one too many times, like, is that going to do something? But he was very, I'm sure there's more there. But that was very interesting to me because um, he said it set a daunting standard, meaning mm. an, an expectation for, um, you know, what, what interactions should look like, um, what, what power dynamics are at play, you know, between, you know, men and women in particular. Um, I thought that was super interesting. And, um, yeah, there's, there's a really, um, amazing part of this book where he basically said like he would treat someone so horrible, but that was like almost his way of showing love. And when they would finally wake up and be like, this is not working for me, he'd be like, I can't live without you, which is like, so many of us know that guy or that gal. Um, he's also very, very hard on, quote, crazy people, crazy women. Um, and he does this in his stand-up as well. But, um, you know, he mentioned that he dated someone who um, had borderline personality disorder. And and he talked about kind of what 
you know, what a, what a trip that was to try and kind of constantly be, be pleasing that person. But so much of his life, as much as he really does get away from a lot of the dynamics of his parents, so much of it, you know, hits that wound, right? Mm -hmm. Of, you know, where are your needs too much? Where are my needs too much? Um, he also spoke about how comedy for him and his podcasting too, because in his podcasting, the first usually eight to 15 minutes of every show is a stream of consciousness about what's going on for him. And for some people who are like, well, okay, so what? Sitting down and recording in an articulate fashion, eight to 12, 15 minutes on any topic is not only difficult, <laughs> but to do it continuously for a thousand plus episodes. It's just, it, it's his, but I think it's much more his existence. Like for us, for me, I'm still like, what do we say? What do we talk about? Like, I think. But this is what I'm saying. Hold he's on. mastered not giving a shit. But so that's <laughs> not what I think it is. There is an element to that. You have to not care because you have to be so open and vulnerable and he's sharing it with this, such a large audience. You also have to be like, what is actually going on for me? Mm. Where I'm going with this is the ability to uh, have that introspection and narrate it. Mm. Most of us are just going through life. Right, feeling it. Feeling it, and I'm not really sure what it means. And then we try to go to therapy or somewhere else and, and articulate like, oh, I feel this. But for him to put an entire narrative around it and what he said, and this is what really struck me, was that he did that as a way of recreating himself. Mm -hmm. He was so lost. He was so unsure of who he was that stand up and storytelling and building this narrative over and over and over again in its mm. new iterations. It was his new self. He's actually creating himself in every mm. moment and having his art as an expression of how he's creating himself, I find fascinating. Um, and, and speaks directly to him saying that he felt denied a fundamental sense of self, you know, as, as, a, as a child because of, you know, his parents. Um, but what's also interesting in his special from Bleak to Dark, which is now out on HBO Max, um, he chooses to be vulnerable. I mean, so vulnerable. Like, vulnerable is not even the word. He chooses to walk us through what it was like to lose the person he was in love with, his partner, suddenly and during COVID. And very there's suddenly. very, very suddenly unexpected. I mean, it's, you can't even put words to it, but he, when I asked kind of like why I thought his answer was very interesting. He said it was inevitable. Like the only place that he could want to take that mm. was where he took it. He took it to his art. He took it to his writing and he wanted to perform it. Mm -hmm. And, um, he did. He talked He talked about how humor relieved grief, which is like, you love humor. This is a whole You topic. love it. Okay, we're going to circle back to that. Keep going. He talked about how humor, you know, helped his grief and how he couldn't imagine. Like, he went, he went behind the mic right after she died. And, and he and said. And re-released the episode that he had recorded with her previously. Right. And I, and I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around I totally get that he felt comforted, but that's the level of comfort that he has with the microphone, you know, and with that audience that he could go in a state of tremendous acute grief and he didn't have to think about it. He didn't have to plan it out. Like the the special, you get to hear kind of the, the Mark Maron crafted way of presenting it. Here's why I respect that so much, because what you're witnessing is someone in, in a process. Mm. They're not, he's not packaging this. Right. It's not like, oh, I have some idea. I'm going to work on it. Then I'm going to present it. Then I'm hoping to get feedback. Like this is like his persona, who he is. And he's working that out in real time. There was something that he also said when we talked about, you know, him kind of returning to the world, um, you know, after being in such acute grief. And I believe the quote was, where else would I go? Yeah. He's like. If not that, then I'm just sort of sitting at home, wallowing in it. He created a real community. I mean, he's created a community and identity for himself um, with his podcast that um, that touches many, many people. And there are, I think, many 
many people who listen to him and follow him want his wisdom and and his cynicism, which is, you know, I, I find very ende endearing. But um, I, I really found it interesting how such a sort of self-professed, you know, misanthrope feels so connected and wanted to be raw and wanted to be open with his people. Like, I thought that was very sweet how, how much it means to him that he has this community to go to and that when Lynn passed, like, of course that's where he went. I thought that was very interesting. He's, he really is. He's a, a lovable curmudgeon, you know? <laughs> that's the perfect title for him, lovable curmudgeon. <laughs> Mind the Alex Breakdown is supported by Lomi by Pila. Many of us experience eco guilt. I know that I do. It's that feeling that you're not doing your part to help the environment. Well, this is very exciting. I have a way to fix eco guilt. I got a Lomi. Lomi turns food scraps into dirt with literally the push of a button. It's a countertop electric composter. It turns scraps to dirt in under four hours. And in case you're like, it's gonna smell. It doesn't smell when it's running and you know, it's really loud. It's not, it's really quiet. Thanks to Lomi, we have way less garbage each week. We have one right here in the podcast studio. You can go from three bags per week to one. That means you're saving bags of garbage from landfills, thereby producing less methane. We can turn waste into nutrient rich dirt that we literally feed to our plants. Neighbors have started asking me, why are you throwing out less garbage? Can I put my garbage in your trash can? The answer is yes, but also maybe get a Lomi so that you also have less waste. If you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just make cleanup after dinner that much easier, Lomi is perfect for you. Also, my kids love it because like they don't have to deal with trash anymore. They just put it in the Lomi. Head to Lomi.com slash breakdown. Use the promo code breakdown and you can get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to lomi.com slash breakdown. Use the promo code breakdown at checkout. Food waste is gross. Let Lomi save you a cold trip out to the garbage can. My Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. Listen, I am always getting to know myself. That's part of why I go to therapy. So many times in my work or as a mom or just as a human being, people will say things to me or my kids will say things or I'll be confronted with something that's really uncomfortable. And many times it turns out it's me. And that's a constant process of being able to analyze what's my role in every situation that I'm part of. Getting to know yourself really is a lifelong process, especially because we're always growing, we're always changing, and new things come up all the time. Therapy is about deepening your self-awareness and your understanding, because sometimes we don't know what we want or we don't know why we're reacting the way we do because we have to talk it through. BetterHelp can connect you with a licensed therapist who can take you on the journey of self-discovery from wherever you're at. I'm one of those people who has committed to being in therapy probably forever. It's a process that I want help with. I need help with. If you're thinking of starting therapy, please give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. You can switch anytime for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash break today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash break. Let's talk about comedy at, when it's appropriate and when it isn't. Let me tell people a little bit about Jonathan. A lot of the episodes that you hear... All my jokes are cut out. We have to cut out a lot of his jokes. That's not true. Be, That's not actually true. You're very fun. First of all, Jonathan is hilarious. Let's have jo an internet poll. Jon <laughs> Jonathan's hilarious, but he uses his humor like a weapon. And when any emotion gets too close or too real, he has to make a joke. Is that true? Often in this <laughs> podcast, I raise my finger. If you're only listening, I, I put my hand up, one finger in the air and say, I object. <laughs> I object Do you to object? the categorization. First of all, when we first started to, to know each other, we had, a, we had an agreement, which I think got a little... <laughs> taken uh, out of context. The agreement was, if there's a great joke, no. you don't leave it on the table. Right, but that's completely subjective. Because very, you... <laughs> very subjective, it turns out. And it turns out that a great joke 
<laughs> can be interpreted differently by different people. Well, I think one of the things about your sense of humor is you're very playful. Also, and you like to insert playfulness I into do. very, not just serious moments, but moments where it you have to leave a tender moment alone, as Billy Joel said. It also turns out... <laughs> So happens. So happens that someone who might otherwise really enjoy a specific joke is often in a bad mood and doesn't want to hear your jokes. Might not enjoy that joke if they're not in the right frame of mind. And later, if they heard that joke again, would be like, you're right, that is funny. Are you proposing that we do outtakes of all the things <laughs> that I tell Val, that I roll my eyes about and say like, Valerie, can you please make it not, yeah. So Mark Marin, the other thing about him, if you've listened to WTF, is he's a philosopher of comedy. He wants to know what makes things funny. Mm. He wants to know where comedy comes from. It's an analysis. This ties back to, does comedy come from pain? And... I am not a comedy philosopher, but what I do know is that using comedy to transmute pain, the notion that we either laugh or we cry, I totally believe in. And so areas where you're like, that's an inappropriate joke, I'm not saying it is because I would otherwise cry, but I do believe it's right. in a transmute. Mution? Is that, is that the word? No. No. What is that it word? It transmutes. I don't think you To can... transmute. Yeah. Uh, intense emotion and bring okay, so, levity to it. I okay. think we need levity. If we're not this having fun, okay. why bother? Okay. <laughs> Here's the thing. I agree you with you. You don't like fun. No. <laughs> I agree with you. But. But. Is it also possible <laughs> when the rhythm of a conversation or an emotional movement is happening that you simply cannot resist saying the thing in your head, much like a 14-year-old child, <laughs> and you can't gauge. And it, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of spectrum in here sometimes, I think, for you, because I often think like, do you, can you not read the room? <laughs> <laughs> like, if I'm already crying about something, <laughs> that's a great time not to poke fun at me. I'm curious. This is what I want to ask you because, like, this is actually something I'm very curious about. What's your mom's sense of humor like? It's a good question. Um, I don't see my mom as all that funny. Okay. I'm sorry, mom. She, I, she's very, very, very intelligent. Very lovely, well read. Talented. Good storyteller. Yes. Loves literature. A giver. Great writer. Um, I don't see her as a humorist, although she understands. Okay. What's funny? Okay. A and I say that because my sister, God okay. love her, she doesn't understand. Sometimes jokes. your sister will say things to me like, "I'm not understanding what you're saying," and I'm like, "Oh, that's too much of a joke." Like the we we tease her a little bit because when she was like twelve, thirteen, fifteen years old, we would have to explain the that like the comic section of the newspaper we still got newspapers back then and my dad would be reading that at breakfast and he would pass us the uh comics and my sister would not understand them okay tell us about your dad's sense of humor my dad is very funny my grandfather was very funny okay but your your dad is is very selectively funny yeah it's true he's he's selectively funny and like you he, could meet him and not know that he's funny yeah that's true and um I feel like there's a way that you learned to use humor maybe because of your upbringing that made it so that this is an intervention okay, is what on. this episode uh, this, is. This sounds like an analysis. Let's, let's, let's get, let's go there. Well, how did I use humor based on how I grew up? Um, I, I'm everyone was so serious. I needed to lighten uh, it up a little bit. Jonathan translated as gift from God <laughs> <laughs> needed to bring some levity <laughs> You're also the baby of the family. I'm the baby, yeah. You're the baby. Yeah. I got there. Everyone was so, <laughs> you know, they were they were so serious. I was going to be funny even as a detriment to myself. Were you funny in school? Were you like a jokester? No. I was quiet in school, I think. Uh, yeah. No, oh. I wasn't really. I don't remember being funny. Actually, it's funny because I don't remember being funny a as a kid so much. I would tease my brother a lot who was always in a bad mood, but that would sort of just antagonize him and then I would have violence uh, thrust put, upon you. Thrust upon me, exactly. Um, 
No, I don't think I don't know. But that. you you have an MFA in in writing and in particular screenwriting. Like you're funny as a writer. Yeah, I'm I'm hilarious. <laughs> Some of my favorite parts of this podcast are when we get to speak to a comedian and uh, every, now and, laugh. every now and again, I, I mean, I have a moment where uh, Seth Rogen laughs at something <laughs> I've said. I don't remember what. I got Mark a couple times. Mm-hmm. And I, it's different when you make a funny person laugh because they go like this. They like they give you a nod that you're like, oh, OK, I uh, recognize that you have, you know, obviously not their skill. It's not the right? talent, but it's like, oh, you can throw a. Uh, something into the ring. As a neuroscientist, I'm also fascinated about humor and where humor lives in the brain. There are certain regions of the brain, if if lesioned or or or, or injured, um, you will get inappropriate laughter is mm. one of the, the features of of certain syndromes and and of certain injuries. Are you suggesting um, I have brain lesions? No. The the but see that's a great example of I was <laughs> Like telling a narrative, like especially like something scientific. And I don't know if like your brain is like too much science. No. But I was literally like I was trying to weave something. And what that <laughs> joke did is it it disrupted like just the rhythm of, of human speech. So anyway, that being said, I'm fascinated, you know, where all of this lives in the brain. Because humor and comedy, as I think, as I think Mark really showed us, it is it is an it is not just telling jokes you no. know it is not just being able to find things that are funny it's being able to be vulnerable with yourself enough to know where others can join in your reverie yes and it's also about any form of belonging because if you hear comics and comedians who are often outsiders if you make someone laugh that means they're not going to hit you <laughs> And if you make someone laugh, it means that, A, they might want you around and they might accept you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, for me, I remember a lot of like trying to cheer my brother up who was a very moody uh, teenager and who struggled and felt pressures at school. And a lot of my behavior was oriented around trying to make him less angry or Sometimes the anger would come out at me and then he was less angry or trying to cheer him up or just trying to engage. And definitely there's an element of like, oh, if I can make someone laugh, mm. then uh, they probably feel a little lighter. And if they feel a little lighter, I don't have a conscious under uh, connection to this, but it's it, a lack of threat. It's a lack of threat. And it's also like, oh, if they feel a little lighter, then that's sort of a better state to be in. Were you funny as a kid? Yes. When did you discover that you were I funny? remember making people laugh, like, as, as young as I can remember. I would do shows with my brother. We would do, like, shows for my parents and, you know, guests and stuff. I mean, we have pictures. I We can actually pull I have a picture. I, I keep it at Jeopardy. Um, yeah, I have a little cane and a little hat. And um, I wasn't, like, a hammy kid, but, you know, it was probably, like, a little Borscht Belt comedy special. The first time I remember making other kids laugh, I would do impressions of kids. Not... Not mean-spirited impressions, because I was a very, um, you know, at least I remember myself as like a kid who was always befriending the kids in the special ed class and like defending them when kids would tease them and beat them up and throw things at them. And, you know, I was a very emotional and like feeling child, but um, I was a really good mimic. Mm. And that made other kids laugh because I would mimic kids' voices or, um, yeah, one of my first roles um, was a... Um, you know, a play, uh, Ms. Julie Drake was my, my drama teacher and it was called like the Christmas pig. And it was like a kind of a very broad, you know, Southern comedy. And I had to put on like a Southern accent. I was just in long johns, like, you know, like, like oatmeal colored long johns with a bandana and, and high top converse and like my hair and pigtails or something. But I remember doing accents and I, I don't know. I just like, I watched a lot of sitcoms as a kid. You know, I was like raised on television. Like television was my, my third parent. Okay. Quick interjection here. Cause this yeah. relates. I also watched a lot of television growing up. But Canadian television was a lot of no, had Ameri oh. no, we had American television. <laughs> hockey. We did watch hockey, but I watched a <laughs> lot of sitcom. And when you say, oh, you say a joke that interrupts the natural form of speech, the nature of sitcom structure is set up, set up punchline. And I just it just occurred to me right <laughs> now. <laughs> like vulnerable narrative, punchline. <laughs> That's what... That's what I'm Why saying. Why are you I'm skipping like, setup, setup? <laughs> <laughs> but there is the like jokes per page ah, so, nature of okay. television. And I do wonder if that 
so there's impacted a, my timing and sensibility. I think you don't. If I had to, if I had to do an analysis of why sometimes I think your comedy is <laughs> is mis misplaced, I say this lovingly. Um, there's a rhythm that you know. I think people who are trained actors have to have. I don't know that you have that rhythm all the time. So sometimes, like, if something's not ready for a punchline and you stick it in there, it can feel like out of order, like a little chaotic. That's what it kind of feels like is like, I'm not ready for your joke yet. <laughs> that would be the title of my poem about you. I'm not ready for your joke yet. A poem about Jonathan Cohen. Or I'm not ready for your joke yet. I'm currently crying. <laughs> Um, I, both of my parents were, were quite funny. Um, and my father actually was an actor. Like, you know, he did plays and stuff mm -hmm. when he was a kid. And I, I've seen pictures of my father of blessed memory and he was very ham, you know, he's very hammy. He had a really great body language and like there's pictures of him in Finian's rainbow and he's, you know, dressed like a little elf and, um, and, and my mom also, my mom was a, a beautiful singer. So my mom was, and very, uh, like, you know, a talented seamstress. And, you know, she was very artistic. Um, but she was funny. And my mom and I, in, in my family, there's a, a a branch of my family, we laugh literally until the laugh becomes silent. And then you start, and then tears come. And most of the women in my family on the Winkleman side, it's a, it's, it seems to be a Winkleman trait, and, and a couple of the males as well, it's a very specific laugh that we get to. And then it's just silent and you're just, your body is just like racked with laughter. But my mom and I, I mean, we would, we were, we would laugh so hard. Like when I was a teenager, I had great times with my mom like that. First time I saw you with sort of your extended family was at uh, Fred's Bar Mitzvah and your cousin Linda. My aunt Linda. Yeah, yeah sorry. My your tante aunt, Linda. Your aunt Linda, Linder. Uh, you had her going. You were just holding court and it was actually- I was very a, funny in my family. Yeah. And it was a side of you that you just like kept- Oh, my cousin Jacob. My cousin Jacob is um, 10 years younger than me. And so, you know, when he was born, I was 10 and he was like, oh my gosh, we have a baby, you know? And, um, you know, they lived in San Jose. They lived six hours from me. But as Jacob got older, he was my best audience because my next closest cousin was six years younger than me. And she was kind of like my sister. Like we were like sisters. Yeah. But this was like I had an audience and it was my favorite thing was to make Jacob laugh. And I would just I would do impressions of my professors and my teachers. And, and my it was so joyous to make, especially a kid and a teenager. It is so much fun to make them laugh, but to keep it going. It's so yeah. here's my question for you. You're a comedic actor, not a comedian. Right? Why? Why? Uh, uh, Say more. I don't know what your you, distinction you've is. You've been on television. You have amazing comedic timing. Oh. You have been in comedy for decades. Uh-huh. But a comedian to me is someone who stands up on stage. Oh, so I think of like Lucille Ball as a comedian, meaning it's a, whatever, it's it's a nomenclature distinction. But yeah, I'm, I am an actor. But yeah, I do consider myself a, a comedian. But you're right. I'm not a, a stand-up stand comedian. Up. Right. Right. Okay. So the yeah. difference is in stand-up versus. Yeah. Also, you are a writer. You wrote a screenplay. You've it, written yeah. books. So you have all the skill sets. No. Nope. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> no. Here, yeah, here no. we go. Yeah. Just bear with me. That's you what are, I've been doing for three years. You've been a performer as a kid. You actually can improv amazingly because I've seen you with your family where you're just That's like. That's not improv. You're you're holding I'm court. <laughs> You're quick-witted. It's not long-form improv, which we've discussed in other episodes if you haven't heard those. However, you have never done stand-up comedy. Correct. No. I think there's something in there that could take all of those skills. I should workshop with Mark Marin. <laughs> Mark, I know you're not listening to this, but we'll start an internet craze. Mime needs a mentor. <laughs> a stand-up mentor. Jonathan, I want to thank you for encouraging us to have Mark Marin on the podcast. I'm very glad that he came and talked with us. And it was fascinating in and of itself. If you haven't heard, obviously, the, the episode, please. Go back to Tuesday. Please go back to Tuesday, listen to it. Go back to the Tuesday when you can listen to it. Um, but also it brought up so many interesting things. And, and also I was astounded at his comfort 
you know, with speaking about such vulnerable things. I, I find it very inspiring. And he's a complicated guy. And, and as he talks about in his book, he's got quite a history. Um, and um, I just, I'm really grateful that he has kind of shared so much of himself with his podcast audience and that he uh, shared it with ours. I totally agree with you. And the one additional takeaway that I got was that speaking about these difficult topics is actually a trainable skill. Mm. You could tell at some times in the episode that he was more emotional than others, but he was able to hold that emotion and where some people kind of shut down when they reach that level of emotionality, when, when the sort of bottom floor rises a little bit and the pressure gets a little bit more, mm -hmm. he was able to just channel that into continually being articulate and thoughtful and funny about it and passionate. And, you know, I think for myself, how to just keep that is a skill to practice mm -hmm. being able to just continue to be open and vulnerable, even in the face of intense emotion. So I'm inspired. So he even says, if you're vulnerable sharing your experience with mental and emotional problems, and I would even say experiences here, it's going to be helpful in and of itself. And that's why we're here to it share is. that. To There's a lot of ways to process. And I think that's what I think for me, the episode with Mark Maron really showed me. There's a lot of ways to um, to get through your stuff. And um, we are happy to be on the journey with all of you. And thank you so much for listening to our little Thursday breakdown. With uh, tenderness and a little comedy. <laughs> From our Thursday breakdown to the one we hope you never have. We'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's gonna break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two.